one man who has been a marvellous champion of all of this, but more importantly, has found out the frightening truth of it by conducting a Senate inquiry into all of this, and he's head of that inquiry, is a farmer himself. And he's virtually just as Glenn Butel in Ackland is the one-man army. This is the one-man political army, though some people in New South Wales will hear from Jeremy Buckingham later, an MLC, and has put the cat right among the pigeons with a motion that's going to be put to the Upper House of New South Wales later uh, this week, and Jeremy will tell you all about that. But the man in Canberra who's got them on the run is this bloke. Please give him an enthusiastic welcome. He's a friend of yours, Mr Bill Heffernan. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope anybody that's in the sun can find the shade. I've uh, been delegated, I think, 15 minutes to tell you a story that probably takes an hour and a half. But I'd like to begin by saying and declare an interest, I am a farmer. Australia's farmers don't aspire to die the richest person in the cemetery. They aspire to pass the farm on to the next generation. One of Australia's greatest institutions is the institution of family farmers. We tend to take them for granted. Bear in mind that more people live in the western suburbs of Sydney than all of rural Australia. And in the federal parliament, I regret to inform you, there isn't one person in the government, in the parliament, who lives in the bush. There's not one single solitary soul. So ladies and gentlemen, what today is about, I hope, is informing you, because once you're informed, you are in charge. And I have to say my experience so far, regrettably, is that I haven't found a politician from any side who wants to own the problem that I'm about to tell you about. And this is the problem that the world is bringing upon itself simply by propagation. Ladies and gentlemen, by 2050, unless there is some sort of a catastrophe, the world will have nine billion people. 50% of those people, by the science, and bear in mind all science has vagary, so it could be 10% right, it could be 100% right, as indeed all human endeavour has failure, but by 2050, it is estimated that 50% of the world's population will be poor for water. That there will be, as there is now, about a billion people unable to feed themselves. Two thirds of the world's population will live in Asia. 30% of the productive land of Asia will have gone out of production. The food task will have doubled globally. And 1.6 billion people, not million, billion people on the planet could be displaced. These are serious issues. If you go out to 2070, when from now to 2070 the world population will double to a bit over 12 billion people, at the present time the world is losing 1% of its agricultural productive land due to everything from urbanisation to desertification per annum. By 2070, a place like China will have 1.8 billion people. They'll have a serious demographic problem with an AIDS population. And they will have to feed half their population from someone else's agricultural resource. And they are on the march. They are beyond denial, unlike India, who are still in denial. So bring that back to Australia. By 2050, it is estimated and all science, as I say, has vaguely, but if, if, if someone tells you you've got a melanoma on your hand there, you'd either get a second opinion or get it off, so you'd do something about it. It is estimated that if the science for Australia is 40% right, that in the lower Murray-Darling Basin, in most years, there will be zero allocation for general purpose water. Already since 1975, it is a scientific fact that southwest Western Australia has lost 50% of its runoff. And hence you may have noticed in the last few days that they're talking about building a new city in the northern aspects of Western Australia where there are more plentiful water supplies. So that is what we're faced up to with the Global Food Task. Add to that the changing idea of sovereignty due to modern communications, transport and global markets. 
free trade agreements, the World Trade Organisation, etc. We are facing a change to what we thought sovereignty was all about. Sovereignty, once upon a time, was about who had the biggest army, navy and air force. It is no longer about that. It's about who's got the biggest checkbook. China has a non-market currency. The US is technically insolvent, as is most of Southern Europe, as is Japan, and a whole lot of other countries around the world. What we need to understand is that we're asleep at the wheel in Australia. I took, I'm chairing an inquiry also besides coal seam gas, and I'm trying to put a context around the, the, what we're here for today. In Parliament on Wednesday, where the former head of the NFF, a former Reserve Bank board member, told the committee that it wouldn't matter if 30% of Australia's agricultural land was owned by a foreign nation. And I, I mean, I have to get the transcript, it's worth reading, because I gave it to him. Um, that is absolutely morbid thinking. Mick Kelty tried to warn before he left as Commissioner of the AFP Australia by saying the greatest threat to Australia's sovereignty, in his view, was human displacement. Here is a former head, he was head of the BFF as well, I won't name him, saying that it doesn't matter who owns our agricultural resources. What this is all about for places like China, and I can give you the information coming out of China, is to secure that problem they're going to have by 2070 to feed half their population from someone else's resource. That is to directly intervene in the means of production for Australia. Why would Australia be so stupid? And why would our politicians be so contrary? And I, and I don't mean through in any particular way to any particular politician, but most politicians, and I'm, a, I'm allegedly a politician, I'm actually Australia's most disgraced senator, an old farmer from Juneau. Um, um, but most politicians are concerned with the next electoral cycle. I am so, I, I, Tim Duddy will attest to this, I'm very grumpy because I lay awake at night worrying about what we're going to do about where we're going to be in 50 or 80 years time. And this is about sovereignty. This is about controlling our own destiny. To put that into context, most people go to Woolies and Coles and Aldi's and think, oh, well, there's the tucker, and that's that. Well, that's not going to be the case. I mean, already we've changed the attitude with the change of government. This shouldn't be political. This definitely shouldn't be political. But if you believe the science, we've got to win. We've got to, and Mother Nature, by the way, is the referee of all this, not us. We've got to use what Mother Nature is saying is available. There's a whole lot of development opportunities in the north, but the restriction on the development agricultural land is most significant. Could I give you an idea of how stupid you can be and probably Someone in the background will stab me over this. Um, we have locked up the agricultural potential of Cape York Peninsula. Cape York Peninsula is 17 and a half million hectares. It is the size of Victoria. If you take out Cairns, Crooktown, Port Douglas and a few other towns, inland on Cape York Peninsula in an area the size of Victoria, there are 14,000 people. 12,000 of them indigenous. There are an estimated 800,000 feral pigs, 30,000 untagged feral cattle. There are about 14 pastoral stations, and the rest of it is sit-down country or destined to be world heritage. The first kilometre from all those rivers up Cape York Peninsula is every bit as good as the first kilometre from the Murrumbidgee River or the Murray River or the Gwider or wherever. But for a political purpose, this is worrying about where we're going to be at the next election, and I chaired the Traveston Dam inquiry, and it was a shit of a site for a dam, I can assure you. Um, Peter Beattie told me, because I tend not to play the game with this, we can't play politics with people livelihoods. He said, well, Bill, I had to get a deal where I got the inner city preferences for the Greens three elections ago in Brisbane. So I've done a deal with them and the Wilderness Society to lock up Cape York Peninsula from any commercial agricultural production. 
So what we've said to the Indigenous people up there, and I met Michael Ross, who was the chairman of the Cape York Peninsula Land Council, in hearings in Cairns, and I'm chairing it, I said, Michael, how big's the place you live on? This is an Indigenous leader. He said, Bill, I don't know, but it's 80 kilometres from the mailbox to the homestead. And I said, well, what's the homestead like, Michael? He said, well, the white ants have eaten it. What are the fences like? They've all fallen down. This is a huge pastoral station. And this is the opportunity we think we should give our Indigenous people. We are a disgrace. And so what they do is just catch feral cattle. What they should be doing is commercialising their opportunity. But the government has said, now under what we're proposing, we're going to turn all that into world heritage. Now, if you think that's a problem for Australia, let me put that into the global context for you. Bangladesh is an area half, by the way, the average annual wildfire in Cape York Peninsula is 5 million hectares. The biggest they've had is 11 out of 17. So every year, a whole lot of it gets burnt. I don't know who pays the carbon tax on that. But um, Cape Bangladesh is an area half the size, listen carefully, to Cape York Peninsula. It has 160 million people who live in an area where Australia is locked up where there are 14,000 people. The average wage for 80% of the population is less than a dollar a day. They have 57 rivers flow into Bangladesh, 54 of them out of India, who are mining the resource because they're still in denial on the water shortage. And by 2050, if the science is 40% right, Bangladesh will be uninhabitable. Now, I have a view, and that's why this has got to come back, as Alan said, to the people of Australia and to understanding what we will not understand and not lose, miss till we lose it. That is our sovereignty. And you don't have to be accused of being a Hansonite or a xenophobic or whatever. All you've got to accuse of being is a thinking Australian. But the UN is not going to sort this out. Everyone says, oh, the UN will fix it. The UN, ladies and gentlemen, regrettably, and I've been there sitting next to Robert Hill and his jaw hit the table when I said it. When I said it's great to be here in the UN at their executive to meet the largest, most corrupt body on the planet. Um, ladies and gentlemen, the UN has a lot of good things they do, but they are endemically corrupt. And they will not solve the world's displacement problem. So what we've got to do in Australia, and I'm supposed to only have 15 minutes, we had two hours, you wouldn't leave, I can assure you. Um, what we've got to do is protect our sovereignty. But what we've also got to do, we've got an obligation to the rest of the world in the global food task. So as I say, getting now down to business with coal seam gas and, and mining, I've chaired the inquiry into mining under the uh, floodplain uh, in Gunnedah. I've asked serious questions of Shenhua and BHP, and I got BHP to put in writing that they wouldn't indeed mine under the floodplain. Shenhua hasn't signed up to that. But I did ask Joe Clayton, why in the name of God did you pay $305 million or $310 million for the exploration rights when next door BHP paid $100 million? He said, Bill, money isn't an issue for my employers which is a 68% sovereign-owned Chinese company. And that's why they've been able to pay four times the value to farmers to shut them up and move them on. You can't blame the farmers. But what, and what worries me a lot about the evidence I've received, so that was, that was the Gunnedah inquiry, I'm now doing the coal seam gas inquiry, is that a lot of politicians, a lot of companies think the solution for make good for the farmers is money. And as I said to Mr Wilkinson, the boss of APA, APA the, the coal seam gas representative body, how does money make good a contaminated aquifer? The Queensland advice, which was in 2006 when they gave Santos and uh, Queensland uh, British Gas mining licences for coal seam gas in Queensland, Queensland's made a catastrophic error. And all the people involved politically should be, I better not say it, but they should be 
gotten rid of. Gotten rid of. The advice the Queensland Government has is that if they go ahead, because of the absolute explosion in the event, I mean, Santos and, Brit and Origin will say, well, we've been mining coal seam gas for years, yeah, with about 100, 100 wells. What we're talking about, as Alan said, is 40,000 wells. The advice to the Queensland Government, written to them by their own department, is that there will be no further agricultural water available for agriculture if the coal seam mining gas goes to its full entitlement. No more agricultural water. So what, and, and it also says with regard to make good for farmers who are losing their board, we've taken evidence of contaminated aquifers. How in God's name do you make good a contaminated aquifer? Bakersfield in the US, ladies and gentlemen, is suing a local coal mining company over there for $2 billion because they've contaminated the local water supply. But how do you make good the water supply once you've contaminated it? The evidence we received from the CSIRO was that they, they tried to bullshit their way through, pardon my language, um, with the brief. But eventually I pulled them up and said, this is gobbledygook. What is the truth? The truth was that it could take 300 years to make good the aquifers that they're going to mine this coal seam gas out of. The, the Queensland Government's advice in, the, in this document, and Alan's got it, is that it could take a thousand years a thousand years to make good the damage for a 35 year industry. So as I say, I could go on, but the more I've known and, be and became aware of, the more I think it's important that the people of Australia understand the enormity of the, what the changes we're about to go through. The global energy task is in completely devouring the global food task. The global food task needs a lot of work doing to it. China has set aside 10 years ago 270,000 hectares for prime agriculture production, and they plan to keep it. Well, the pressure in China has been such that they've already lost 10% of the land they've set aside due to urbanisation. This is a serious problem. Australia is the best place in the world to raise a family breathe fresh air and drink clean water. We want to keep it that way. And the only people that will enable that to occur are the people that are elected, that elect the people to make the decisions. And those people are sitting in this garden here today. It's up to all of us. As I say, we've taken it for granted. The global population, when you hear that against the statistic that 50% of the world's population will be poor for water. Bear in mind there is some good news. 97% of the world's water, ladies and gentlemen, is actually seawater. This shows you how short fresh water is. 3% of the world's water is fresh water. Two thirds of the world's fresh water is tied up in snow and ice. So there's only one to one fifty of the world's water available for drinking. But, if we are smart, we can make it work. We absolutely have to understand that we've got to get smarter with our irrigation. I think we made a grave error when we separated land from water title and made it a tradal instrument so someone who's a retired drug smuggler on the Gold Coast can actually own all the water entitlements if he chooses to buy them as an income. I think that's a grave error. But we do have new technology, we do have science. Carnarvon in West Australia is the peak of water science. This is the hope in the side of this. Carnarvon has 3,500 acres of irrigation. They draw 8,500 megalitres, 8.5 8 gigs, out of the Gascoigne Sandbed River, which only runs for 10 weeks of the year. And with that, in 06, 07, when I chaired the Northern Development Task Force, a task force which the present government shut down and destroyed the ethos of, didn't want to develop the North, told the CSIRO, let's see what water's in the North, but you're not allowed to consider storing it or damming it. What a joke. They, in, in, 
in Carnarvon in 06 07, they produced $69 million with capsicums, lunch pack bananas, tomatoes, table grapes, those sort of crops. In the same year, the laziest irrigation scheme in Australia, which I hopefully will become the most efficient at the Ord, used 40 times that amount of water to produce the same income. And in the same year, so they were 40 times less efficient than Carnarvon, in the same year the Murray-Darling Basin was 20 times less efficient. But if we, and, and indeed in the Murray-Darling Basin, if you use the water that they produced to produce $69 million with the latest of technology for water, which is fertigation, which is patented Israeli-Spanish technology, where countries really do value their water, if you use that amount of water that they produce $69 million worth of income farm agricultural produce with in Murray-Darling Basin to produce a cotton crop, you would have got yourself one and a quarter million dollars. That's the difference in the efficiency. So we can use science, uh, we can use technology. At the present time, the world is spending $40 billion a year on agricultural research. We should be spending at least $80 billion. And to put that into context, I think we spend something like one point three to seven trillion dollars on defence research. So we're taking our food for granted and we shouldn't. I'd love to talk for longer but I feel I um, the more I know about coal seam gas, the worse I feel about it. Thanks.